I, I really like that record, so I got into it. I, I, I think we skipped a couple of things here because uh, I know that Al is in, was into much more of a country blues scene. Oh, yeah, the thing like he is. Yeah, after I that Muddy Waters, and I heard Robert Johnson and Hooker mm -hmm. and them two, they're soloists, sing, they sing and then they play guitar solos. <laughs> and they, they sounded really great. Mm -hmm. So those were like after Muddy Waters, that was it. But see, Muddy Waters, that was like the best harmonica. It's ever been on a record practice. Yeah, definitely on that record. So that got me the harmonica. Was in that record. Was that? Little, little wall that right mm -hmm. all through that record. I heard Blind Lemon in '58. Blind Lemon who? Blind Lemon Orange? Blind Lemon Jefferson. And I was struck by a divine revelation, and it was over. Right. Right. I, I got and into. It, you I know you've been collecting records since '50, but this was the first country blues. The first, you had heard. the first country blues record, the pre-war country blues record I ever heard was, well, it wasn't planned. That was a joke. The first one I ever heard was, uh, uh, like, you can't call Washboard Sam Country Blues King. No. It's pre-war. Well, it's, it's not It's not country. Let's see. I think uh, a big Bill Brunsey record I, and on Champion, which was done around 1930, was the first country blues record I ever heard. And uh, I liked it. And uh, I, I went through a thing that a lot of people did. Jimmy Reed is the cat that really got me into blues. And, and and it's easy uh, it's easy to to start to like blues by liking Jimmy Reed. And I used to be on a big crusade. I used to have people come over to my house that weren't really into blues. And I used to get them into blues by starting them off on Jimmy Reed, and then getting them into Little Walter and then Muddy Waters. And it was a, a thing. I mean, Elmore James. I used to have a little pattern I'd follow. If they got into Jimmy Reed, then I can always get them into Little Walter or, or Muddy Waters. And if they got into that, Elmore James was next, and then Robert Johnson, and then psh, from there I had to convert. <laughs> I used to do that all the time. Uh, my first, the first blues record I ever owned, I was only six or seven years old. My father brought it home. See, in California, we had uh, jukebox records in all the drugstores and dime stores. And I was sick, and I was a record freak when I was a little kid, like I already said. And uh, he brought me a present home. You know, he grabbed a nine-cent record off the pile. It didn't make any difference what it was, and he just brought it home and gave it to me to make me happy. And it was uh, a record by Thunder Smith called Big Stars Are Falling, and that made an impression on me when I heard it, and that was a long time ago. So that was the first blues record I ever had. The second blues record that I ever had was a uh, Boyd Gilmore record, and All In My Dreams, which is a which is an Elmore James type thing, and that was like in about 1951. Well, both of those were about 50 or 51. And uh, then I had a mutual friend, and we both we both collected rock, you know, rhythm and blues records. We were into Fats Domino a lot and Big J McNeely <laughs> and guys like that. And uh, we got a bunch of old records from an old folks home in California, and there was a bunch of old jazz records, and we got into that, into that bag, collecting old jazz. And um, if you're collecting old jazz, the next step, if you're really into the records, is blues. And uh, that's how I got into collecting pre-war records. Of course, when I was younger, even younger than when I started buying rhythm and blues, I was my parents were into, you know, swing records. Glenn Miller and Tommy Dorsey. My father played Sammy K. And what did he play? Trumpet. And uh, you know, so it's, uh, music is where it's at. You know, I've often said if I ever went deaf, I'd just end it all. <laughs> because there wouldn't be any sense. Of, you know, if I had a choice between seeing and hearing, I would rather hear. Well, which is you know, been pretty hard choice to make, but that's where I'm at. I'm curious, uh, what, if for some reason you weren't in, into music, let's just say, what would you be into? What's the thing you like best after music? Eating. Eating. Something too much future in that. Oh, As a profession, anyway. Uh, you know, I don't know. I never really thought about it because I don't know what else there is. Uh, I collected coins for a while, but. Uh, <laughs> What's well, that? The, the kind of thing I'm thinking of is is that uh, I think we've all seen that various musical forms like blues or old time rock and so forth have just sort of a limited commercial lifespan. And I'm always sort of curious what a guy who's really professionally into into music would do if the kind of music he was into no, was no longer commercially profitable. Uh, I think about that a lot. And uh, I really don't know what I would do. I, I've, when I worked in a record shop, uh, 
90, I, I think I was about 97% correct when I could pick a hit record. Hmm. When we'd get a batch of new records in, I could usually pick the hit. And uh, I consider myself having a pretty good ear for, t for, for rock records. And I'd like to produce. Everybody does. Everybody wants to produce. That's you know, the next step. There's a lot of lame producers that don't know what they're doing. You know, I just right. sit back and watch all these, these unmitigated assholes you know, try and make hit records that don't know a thing about it. Mm. And it's really weird. There's the guy that produced us is a real nice guy, you know. He didn't know what we wanted. We, he didn't produce our record. His name's on there. It says produced by Dallas Smith. He didn't produce it. We produced it. We told him what we wanted. We mixed it. We did it all. He was just there because he had to be there. You know, you he want that still in the trash? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Don't want to give you any hassle. Oh, we really, really, really mix it. We did mix it, man. We were sitting here mixing it, man. What did the cat do? The yeah, cat but what, the, you, what you were saying. We get over to, to Al. I think that's the vote for well, that. We didn't get the level. We didn't get the level to start. I think that's, uh, I think yeah, that's, that's, that's one that's what all Dallas's about. strong points. I want to get you on right. the same question now. You know, you know if, if you couldn't make money doing stuff. what you're doing now, you know, where would you, where would your head be at? What would you be I'd either, I'd either, get into ethno musicology, you know, there's non-performing aspects. Mm -hmm. Or I <coughs> might get into botany. Into what? Botany. Botany. Right. I, I might do either of them things. Mm -hmm. The main reason I guess I'm asking this question is because uh, it's rare that you find such a, a group of musicians who are completely dedicated to music. Well, Henry, how about you? Well, I've never done anything else. I've never done an honest day's work. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... If I couldn't play this kind of music, I'd play some other kind of music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what other kind of music? Anything. Uh, r and I'd play. Larry? If I couldn't do what I'm doing now, I'd probably just try to get back into a recording thing, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, probably produce like Bob said, the same thing. Something like that. Or just, you know, produce maybe and maybe also just be a studio guy. That's what I'm doing. How about you? Well, same as kind of room, man. I will play another kind of music. Right. Or maybe maybe I will wash cars or, or clean the floor or someplace. Or I don't know. But music is my thing, you know, that's all. Uh, Nick, Nick brought up a good thing. You might get Nick in to see the record. Nick Pearls. Oh, yeah, yeah well, well, what were you, what? Ah, <laughs> there you go. Now, what were you saying about if you, you know, like, that the musical form might disappear? You mentioned that, that what Canheat is doing is actually dealing with a musical form which has been dead for a long time. So since people are accepting them now, it's less likely that there'll be a fad type thing than, than some group which shows up today and is gone tomorrow. Well, I'm not thinking so much in terms of a fad, because I don't think the music is faddish, but in terms of the fact that nothing sells forever. Well, <coughs> yeah, that's true, but, but if you have a... Um, Blues, which is getting pretty, you know, deeply rooted in this country as a musical form, if you and people were getting interested in it all the time, then you have as people get uninterested, other people come along and get interested, and take their place. So you might have, right. you know, point. you might have like residual sales, whereas other people go up and they drop down. Right. I, mean, I don't think it's like say Fabian. Yeah. Hey, uh, here's a good point. How how do, how do how do you guys? view what's happening today. I mean, uh, where do you think the, the record buying public is at today and where do you think they're headed? Not necessarily in, in terms of your effect. music, but just in general. In white or, or black? Take your pick. Well, the black music, is, the black people are definitely getting away from, from, from blues because they don't want to be reminded of cotton picking. You know? Right. Uh, they'd rather, you know, boogaloo down Broadway. You know, that's where they're at. And uh, one thing we should say, though, that as much as most of the black people, you know, say they don't like it, you know, it's, it's Uncle Tom music. All the boogaloo is, is is blues. I mean, if you really get down to it, it came from Mississippi, man. Charlie Patton was playing the first boogaloo record. Yeah, I don't agree with that at all. Oh, well, <laughs> if you listen, if you listen to the radio station, well, I don't know, in New York, for instance, as white people get to accept the boogaloo more, and as the uh, Motown starts to make the white list. The uh, spade stations have gone into much more blues stuff. Well, that may be even You know, like even R and B. Wait a minute. Let's let's get this from out. Boogaloo the melodies are are descended from Negro religious music, so it is it has roots in uh, Negro country music, but not so much blues roots. Ray Charles.